Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today is yet another very special program. It's my great pleasure to introduce another new guest host for the new Thinking Aloud channel. I'm talking about Dr. Callum Cooper, who has been a guest on this program a couple of times. Cal is a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Northampton in England. He is author of Telephone Calls from the Dead, a revised look at the phenomenon 30 years on. He is also co-editor with Steve Parsons of Paraacoustics, Sound and the Paranormal, and also co-editor essentially with Alex Tannis, although Alex was deceased when the book was written, Conversations with Ghosts, about Alex Tannis's amazing career in parapsychology as a research subject. Cal is going to be interviewing me today. He was also one of the award winners of the Bigelow Institute essay competition. He'll be interviewing me about my essay. I'm sure you'll find that his style is different than our other new guest host, Emmy Vadness. Cal, as I mentioned, lives in England, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Cal. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Hi, Jeff. Um, thank you for having me on as a guest host today as well. It's really good to see your face again um, after Las Vegas. Doesn't seem that long ago, but it was a fantastic experience. Yes, we both had the honor of being Bigelow Institute uh, Essay Competition Award winners. So, congratulations to you. And I'm delighted to welcome you and introduce you as a new guest host for the New Thinking Aloud audience. Well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. And I heard you did quite well at the essay competition. So, uh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> So, um, hosting hosting today and interviewing you. So this is quite interesting. Um, I know there's usually a, an introduction to the uh, the person that's being interviewed, and I know you for having written the Roots of Consciousness, the PK Man, and also Psi Development Systems as well. That's one book that, in all of our previous conversations, has not really come up at all. So I think I want to start our interview on that. So could you tell the audience a bit more about that particular book? Because I think that's one that's less known about, really. Well, it was based on my doctoral dissertation, Cal, at, at Berkeley. It was originally the first draft written in 1980. And w what I was endeavoring to do was to provide a, an overview for the whole field of training psychic abilities. So the book is divided, as I recall, into four sections. It includes all the experimental work in parapsychology that might be relevant to training psychic abilities. But I also looked at some of the ancient traditions of shamanism and yoga and witchcraft and, and the like, as well as uh, modern contemporary programs ranging from silver mind control to Scientology to various popular programs that uh, are some of them are still around like the Berkeley Psychic Institute had had a program to train psychic readers and in fact there are some people in parapsychology today who have come out of that tradition and and then I had a theoretical section dealing with uh, both methodological and, and theoretical issues associated with training psychic abilities. And how was it received? 
Uh, actually, very well. I got a, you know, all my faculty members approved it as a dissertation. The book was eventually published in hardbound uh, by McFarland Publishers, and then later on, it became a Ballantine paperback. Uh, as far as I know, it, it's been reviewed positively, not only in the parapsychology journals, but uh, there was a as I remember, a very nice review in the Psychological Bulletin. So, uh, it, I can't say that the book is still current. There's been so much uh, new work since that book came out, and, and nor can I say it was very popular in its day because it, for, for popular readers of how to cultivate psychic abilities, it may have been too academic and for Many academics that might have been a little too popular. So, I, I it, it didn't really achieve a wide readership, but I'm very proud of it. And we're only talking about this the other day when we were lecturing for uh, lecturing myself and, and colleagues for the Californian Institute for Integral Studies, and I was doing a lecture on um, RSPK, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, and psychokinesis. And part of my lecture suddenly led to talking about remote viewing because we'd spoken about Nina Kalagna and her influence on metal and non-metal objects, including influencing the rate of a frog heart, where some of those studies were published in English in the Journal of Paraphysics. And with that, I was talking about how some of the, the military personnel were practicing. And we even talked about Felicia uh, Perez and how, again, without practice, these abilities um, fell away. Um, and so I've also noted Scott Rogo wrote a book on psi potentials and developing them. I know Stan Krippner did. I think Charlie Tart has as well. Have you practiced any particular ability yourself at one time and felt that you were actually getting really good results out of it and without practice it fell away? Or any individual you can relate to around the time that you were producing that book that had a go and stuck with it? In the days when I was uh, working on developing psychic abilities, I uh, worked with Russell Targ quite a bit in uh, remote viewing. And he basically had the attitude, you don't need training. He said, Here, here's what you do. Come into this dark room with me, radio shielded room, Faraday cage kind of room, very rigorous setup they had at SRI International. And close your eyes and you can be psychic. Just focus on uh, the outbound experimenters, what they were called in those days, or the, or the target situation, and describe what you see. Uh, Russell might say something like, give your subconscious, ask your subconscious to give you permission to obtain accurate information. And Russell is kind of a magical guy over and over and over again. He would produce positive results. He has an incredible track record uh, as a, in terms of his published research and remote viewing in that regard. Uh, direct hits, probably over 90% of uh, the remote viewing trials. But you have to also appreciate he might spend a whole day on one trial. You know, have lunch with the person, have a nice conversation, show them your um, laboratory and your multi-million dollar military industrial think tank where you are. And, and so the whole atmosphere suggests that this is going to work. And, and Russell says, yeah, everybody here does it the first time. And so when I started practicing uh, remote viewing, that was the basic attitude I had going into it. While I was a graduate student, Cal, I had the idea of doing a formal experiment uh, in this regard with remote viewers. And what I found, and that experiment is included in my book, but minimized because First of all, there were some methodological problems that we didn't discover until afterwards. But second of all, what I did predict and what did happen is that a lot of people, when they first discover they can do remote viewing, they get excited. 
and also a little frightened. And the idea of doing it right away the first time is one thing because you have what Zen people would call beginner's mind, which uh, from a Zen perspective is, is a very good thing to have. The beginner's mind is sort of very open. But after that, people get a little frightened and, and worried and they begin to develop self-doubts and they begin to wonder if they can do it repeatedly over and over again. And I think for many people, that's where the training becomes important to learn how to sustain what is already a very natural talent that you can do right off the bat. See, I've never worked with, with anyone in a training capacity. I, I've had the other sides to it. So people claiming abilities, and that's more so my interaction with mediums. And we've never to date, even though a lot of people think that of university departments that deal with parapsychology, that we're testing people that claim abilities all the time. Not really. I don't remember the last time that that happened really for us. Um, even though we go out into the, the real world and interact with these people at various events, we're usually testing, you know, members of the general population to see how good are certain people within that population. And we can look at the, the best scorers to the weakest scorers. But what we did do, well, actually, I'll stick with remote viewing. We, we were, when we were doing the remote viewing trials, Chris started with a pilot that I think was published in 2007 in the Journal of the Society of Psychical Research with Stuart Flint. Um, and then I was involved in the next major run and Chris did two more after that. So it was a year or a couple of years ago, a summary of all those studies was published in the Journal of Parapsychology and made open access as well, which is really good. We had a Gansfeld trial as well. It was between a traditional technique and a Gansfeld technique. And um, for viewers that are hearing about Gansfeld for the first time, it's a, um, it's a method of inducing um, altered states of consciousness. People are usually in a reclining chair. They have eye shields on red light beaming down and after a relaxation procedure that they hear they then get about 40 minutes or so of, of pink noise as we call it so not quite like white noise it's more reduced hiss more pleasant to listen to and when we were running these trials it was on the flip of a coin whether the one participant that you'd taken off of campus um, did the traditional technique first or Gansfeld and I got my housemate at the time to come and have a go. And he was studying sociology, was a massive James Randi and Penn and Teller fan. And so he knew about claims of uh, psychic phenomena, but was dead against it um, because of this background that he came in from. But having never read parapsychology, but knew that he was studying in a university in the social sciences that has a parapsychology department. And he had a go. And if I remember correctly, when he did the, he did the um, Gansfeld, afterwards, we took them through to a debriefing room that showed on the computer a Google Earth map of what the location was. And he got it spot on. And his response was, you've set this up, haven't you? You know, that this is an absolute trick. You're joking me. I went, no, 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 this is the whole point. So that was really weird that he was so against the idea. I'll, you're a friend. Of course, I'll come in and have a go for you and gets it spot on. I can't remember for the life of me how he did on the the more traditional technique where um, he went through ideograms and um, in that case it was a fake um, grid reference that we got them to focus on and then textures and do some drawings. Um, but it was a good session overall and I, I wonder what would happen with someone like him that was very skeptically inclined on the extreme if um, we'd had him have a few more goes. Now, you've raised a number of points, Cal. I need to ask you, first of all, uh, uh, what you meant when you used the phrase traditional technique. Tradition more so what had stemmed from the military uh, work. So I think we were working from a program that was developed by Paul Smith, or at least one that Chris Rowe had attended, um, that Chris has been doing for a long time, where he was doing weekend workshops and, and getting people to, again, practice again and again, learn these techniques. And so we were doing the same as researchers with the participants that we brought in. So we were going through this very um, kind of production line process, but also to make sure that we that there was no way we could actually influence the participants either because we didn't know what the target was. It was selected precognitively. And that was part of our method. It was selected after they'd finished. So it was this system of we'll start with a grid reference, then you'll do a, a freely drawn shape without thinking about it, 
colors, textures, shapes, forms. I'll read out a whole list of them. You pick what feels right to you. And then we'll try and take these forwards into how they might turn into a drawing and develop them further. So that's what I keep calling the, the traditional technique. It's It's got its basis in the, uh, the military um, background. I think you're referring to what remote viewers call CRV or controlled remote viewing. It's taught by Lynn Buchanan, by Paul Smith, by Laurie Williams. Uh, it was developed by Ingo Swan, I think also working with Hal put off. I know Laurie Williams, who teaches it, and she was a student of Lynn Buchanan, he had her work for years before he felt that she was qualified to teach it. So, I'm sure if if someone like Lynn Buchanan thought that after taking a few weekend workshops, you and Chris Rowe were training people in that technique, he might be horrified. Uh, <laughs> uh, that said, Let's go back to the experience that you had with uh, your friend who, who who participated, did a spot on remote viewing. And then he said he thought you were tricking him. That's really funny because, um, you know, when Russell Targ was doing remote viewing at SRI, I think Russell was in the program for maybe about a decade, and they got continual funding from the uh, U.S. government during that period from different agencies. Typically, the agencies would send a contract monitor to look in and see what's going on here with this psychic research at SRI, and the monitors would fly in from Washington, D.C., I have many interviews with Russell about this. And then they would say to him basically, well, show me something psychic. <laughs> and he would say to them, you do it. We'll have you be the subject because if, if I show you something, you won't believe it. You'll think it was a trick. But if you do it yourself, then you will believe it. And these were skeptical people, maybe not as skeptical as your friend, but they were hard-nosed government bureaucrats who had no particular interest in parapsychology. One of them was like the deputy secretary of defense, as, as I recall, who, who came in and, and they would do it and experience it for themselves. And the money kept flowing for, uh, even after Russell left, I think a total of 20 years, uh, at roughly a million dollars a year uh, for that research, which is, you know, peanuts in, in terms of a government budget. But it's interesting that even though your friend did it himself, he still thought there was trickery involved. Mm-hmm. I think it was very telling of, again, his background. We, we had a lot of general arguments about differences between psychology and sociology. And it wasn't just parapsychology within that mix. We were talking about um, sexual behavior. And I think we had arguments about Marxism and a number of things. We rarely saw eye to eye, but we had a lot of mutual respect for each other. So even to this day, we get on with each other so well. Um, and yet we were at such extremes on certain topics. But it was also because he'd read so much in one area and I just got my day to day views and vice versa, um, where we were just reading in opposite directions <laughs> rather than overlapping. Let me um, let me throw a curveball and, and go in a different direction now. So we, we talked about side development systems and you saying that was off the back of your PhD, your doctoral thesis being developed that way. Um, a lot of academics really struggle to know how to actually get into their profession once they're going through these postgraduate degrees. And then how do I actually hit the ground running in academia, be it parapsychology or elsewhere? But that was one publication for you. Was that one of your first ones? And if it wasn't, what were the first things you were coming out with? For me, I remember it being basic articles that were in more so parapsychology themed places, but not peer reviewed and, and starting with book reviews and things like that. So do you remember some of your early publications and what they were? Well, it's, it's been a long time uh, now, you know, 50 years practically. Uh, but The Roots of Consciousness was my first book. It came out, the first edition of it came out in 1975. And at the time, I was still in graduate school. I had created an individual interdisciplinary doctoral major. So I was the only student in the program. I had three 
faculty members that later expanded to five who were on my committee. And one of the stages that a student goes through at, at a school like Berkeley is that you have your um, qualifying exam, uh, which takes place before you begin a dissertation. And the qualifying exam is to demonstrate to your faculty members that you've mastered the basic knowledge required in your field so that then you have, they consider you're now ready to write a dissertation. And in my case, there, you know, there was no field of parapsychology at Berkeley prior to that. So the Roots of Consciousness was actually written as a, a way to demonstrate to my faculty that it was the quali that that I was qualified. It's sort of an overview of what I considered uh, the study of parapsychology to be, which I defined it in a unique way as being much more than just experimental parapsychology, much more than psychical research or field studies, uh, but also including uh, ancient philosophical and meditative traditions uh, and um, non-scientific traditions in the culture for exploring psi phenomena uh, in a way that put me at odds with a lot of people in parapsychology back in those days who, who were very hostile towards what they called the occult. They felt, they associated the occult, and I suppose some still do, with the rising tide of superstition, and uh, parapsychologists should have nothing to do with it. Uh, I think the attitude has changed these days, that people like Dean Radin, who just wrote a book on magic and its relationship to parapsychology, understand that we have a lot to learn from these other traditions. Absolutely. So that book's real magic. And I think chapter six of that book in particular, for anyone that um, ends up getting a copy, is really important. It keeps up coming up time and time again. I, we were only discussing it the other day, also because he requotes um, the speech from Jessica Utz at her address for the American Statistical Association, where I think it's so important important because um, Ed May was discussing it the other day with the Swedish SBR lecture combined with the, the British SBR with John Cleese there being present as well and said that he thinks that we're at a turning point with science and um, pushing forward with this post-materialist view and parapsychology and consciousness studies being within there. And I was mentioning today at an IONS uh, conference, I was involved in that talking about after death communications and um, saying that, you know, this post-materialist view is really important, but we're also up against social stigmas, not just from the general public's view, but from editors when we submit papers, um, because we're dealing with a topic here that we haven't allowed to be mundane, as Jessica says. If it were more mundane, more people would accept it. There's some areas that we should be questioning of psychology that are published quite regularly, but because no one's particularly interested and in they're seen as mundane, they get through so easily without question. Ghosts, telepathy, seeing the future before it's happened, it's things that we constantly see in, in media and in fiction. And I think people will always struggle I mean, I think we're changing their views, certainly, but there's there's always going to be that pushing water uphill effect that we're trying to go against that grain. We're, we're trying to say, look, even though they're entertaining, look how common they are. So many surveys recently have shown the commonalities for different things. After death communications, more than 50 percent of the population report them. Telepathy, that can be anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of people reporting that. I think times are changing. How do you feel about public perception and also where we're going with this? Well, the public has always felt this way. The statistics show, I think, as long as they've been measuring, for example, the belief in uh, survival after death, the statistics have been quite consistent in the United States, and I should think even higher elsewhere, uh, over 70% of the population accepts survival. It's a small group of academic and scientific materialists who are the gatekeepers of 
certainly in academia and often in government research funding and so on, uh, who are blocking it because they become, even if they're not personally wedded to materialism, they're afraid to speak out against it for fear of the horse laugh. And certain very tiny organizations like the skeptical committees, the so-called skeptical committees, use the horse laugh as a weapon against many people who would uh, prefer to be public about their own interests, but they know they'll be laughed at and people are afraid, uh, terribly embarrassed to, uh, at the thought that uh, they should be chided for their interest and, and told, you know, that, that it's childish. Do you think that position is starting to fall away now? Because I think we're both seeing in discussions amongst colleagues that some people without naming names that might be seen as um, atheist materialists that you know are also involved in science are encouraging open debate but are backing away from it when challenged. Do you, do you feel that that is actually the, the signpost that things are actually changing because actually they don't know how to have these debates? Well, I think things are changing very, very slowly. And for myself, you know, uh, having sort of gone out on a limb, getting a unique doctoral degree in parapsychology. I know you also have a doctoral degree. I think that two of them. Is that right? <laughs> yes. I, th I think what distinguishes us, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Cal, is that my diploma actually says parapsychology on it. One of mine does. Wonder. Oh. This is the different thing with it. I mean, it's unique on your diploma that it says parapsychology and that's it. The, the top of the, the actual subject area. Traditionally, and I don't know what it's like for country to country, but there are maybe a few universities in the UK that I've seen where it just says awarded doctor of philosophy. Um, but the majority that I've seen usually says, um, for example, Jeffrey Mishlove has successfully defended a thesis entitled gives the full title and therefore is awarded Doctor of Philosophy. That's what I've got both of mine hanging up in the office here. And, and one of them, the starting title is A Parapsychological Inquiry. Um, the other one is um, uh, Spontaneous Post-Death Experiences and the Cognition of Hope, an Examination of Bereavement and Recovery. So there's anomalous experiences in there, but there's no parapsychology in the title. Well, that's that's good to know. I, I have to be careful when specifying how unique my degree is. And there there are hundreds of people who are doing doctoral research in who or have done doctoral research in parapsychology, particularly in your country. Well, the earliest one I remember in the United States was by rereading. I think we mentioned this not so long ago when you and I were in discussion, but I was uh, rereading The Enchanted Voyager which is the um, biography to J.B. Ryan. And one of his first PhD students, and I think was more so being supervised by William McDougall at the time, was John F. Thomas. And he received his PhD there at Duke University on mediumship in the 1920s. Could be argued as one of the first, certainly one of the first parapsychology-based PhDs I'm aware of. Um, and then he very soon after like yourself, republished it as a book. And it came out as uh, a book entitled Beyond Normal Cognition that was published by the Boston Society for Psychic Research. Um, he was considered like a star player, you know, an upcoming figure in parapsychology. But unfortunately, I think three, four years later, um, tragically died in a car accident. Um, so someone that was putting in so much of the research that Ryan was doing in the, the parapsychology department there, and, and unfortunately passed away under tragic circumstances. But his thesis is still in the archive there. And of course, his, his book is still out and about um, for all to read as well. So I, I don't really know the full extent in, uh, there's some brilliant books like um, the Parapsych uh, Parapsychology Foundation did um, a whole international conference on different places in the world that has focused on parapsychology and looked at its history. So I don't know what it's been like in Germany, Japan, Australia, you name it, what the earliest PhDs in the area of parapsychology really are. But I, I think John F. Thomas is the earliest one I'm aware of. He's a very interesting figure. I've been reading the newly published book co-edited by J.B. Rhine's daughter, Sally Rhine Feather, and I'm scheduled to interview her about it in a few days. And 
it's the early letters of uh, J.B. Ryan starting in about in the 1920s and up to 1939, which was really, for him, the establishment of the field of parapsychology at Duke University. And uh, many of those letters were with Thomas, and he, he was a superintendent of schools, as I recall, in the Detroit area, uh, who developed this interest and was constantly encouraging Rhine. And then Ryan, I think, arranged for him to do his doctoral work under McDougall at Duke University, and McDougall had also sponsored Ryan at Duke University. And what Thomas did was focus on his wife had died, and uh, he he began engaging in a lengthy series of sittings with the great British medium Gladys Osborne Leonard. He detailed, he broke down every sentence that uh, she provided into its informational content and, and came up with, I don't recall the exact number now, but it was well over a thousand bits of information that she had provided that he determined with regard to his deceased wife and others. And he he would not be at the seances himself because he wanted to make sure there was no short-term telepathy between himself and the medium. So he'd have a an absent, uh, what was the term, an absent sitter? Uh, I, f I forget the precise term, but other people would go and ask questions of Gladys Osborne Leonard regarding details of his deceased wife. And he determined she was over 90% accurate uh, over many years. I do remember to, um, reading about that, so that's also good to hear, because it was also at the turning point that um, people think that Ryan completely lost interest in mediumship the moment that he got to Duke University. They'd had that background in it, and they'd um, been sort of on the periphery of the whole Mina Crandon incident with the um, American SPR as well. And and so some people were just wanting to wash their hands of doing field investigations and sitting in seances. But I do remember John F. Tom Thomas's um, studies being so meticulous like that and numerous visits as well, but also wanting to try and rule out any personal biases in some of these observations as well, as you say, sort of stepping back a little bit, but still trying to get as much information as possible. Did you ever meet or, or write to J.B. Ryan or even Louisa? I, I met them. And when I first started out in parapsychology, I, as soon as I could, I attended conferences of the Parapsychological Association. My first one was 1973. And it was held, if, if I remember correctly, in in Durham. And uh, so I went to Furnham, as it was called then. He had left Duke University and set up a separate organization, FRNM, Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man. Uh, of course, it's a sexist kind of name. But the point that people explained to me uh, at that time was that the nature of man, he was endeavoring to establish that man had a non-physical nature, that not spiritual. He was basically a metaphysical idealist, but also an empiricist and, and felt that he could use the uh, empirical data of parapsychology to push for a metaphysical idealist mindset model of reality. So I met him, introduced myself as a graduate student in parapsychology. He, the first question he asked me is, who's supervising you? And I told him my dissertation advisor was Michael Scriven, who had given the, uh, I guess, lecture uh, to the Parapsychological Association. I believe it was in 1964 something like that. Scriven was a, a philosopher educated at Oxford. And uh, if I remember rightly, Scriven's lecture to the Parapsychological Association was to compare parapsychology with psychoanalysis. He said, psychoanalysis is a theory looking for data, and parapsychology is a, a, a data looking for a theory. <laughs> That's a really good way of looking at it. <laughs> Ryan said to me, Scriven, he's a good man.
what did you make of Ryan overall? Did you stay in touch with him since that that first initial meeting? And also, a, a lot of writing regarding Ryan and the man, what he was like. Um, he comes across, especially in the biography, as someone that really was, you know, as you say, striving forward, trying to make these discoveries. But he he certainly had control of his department, what he he wanted to have done. He certainly sat at the top. How did you feel about him generally as a person and as a parapsychologist? I only had a brief meeting with him, Cal. He had the parapsychology laboratory, which was well-funded at one time and had large offices throughout Duke University and, and a good staff. But my understanding was that there was quite a bit of hostility towards him from the other psychologists in the department who did not share his worldview and, and that he was very troubled by this. That's one of the reasons, I think, that he left Duke University and set up the Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man. Yeah, so if it came across like that, I meant within the parapsychology lab, because he got people working under him within parapsychology. So, you know, he's he's this figure shining at the top, and but had certain ways he wanted things to be done. I'm aware that there was the wider psychology department as well that just really weren't interested in parapsychology being there at Duke, and and people initially being interested, like Carl Zena, for example, working with with other people as well to help develop the cards and also statisticians coming in that over time that there were fallouts as well which are documented within the biography that that they just didn't like to be associated with it because their name was rapidly becoming so familiar with parapsychology and away from what their other specialists and and interests were as well which uh, i think uh, drove people down after a while <laughs> Well, sure. Academic politics uh, exists everywhere, and it certainly occurs in parapsychology as as well. It, you know, shortly after I met Ryan, while I was still a graduate student, I met, for example, Jay uh, Levy, who was at that time hired by Ryan to become the uh, director of FRNM. And then Levy himself uh, was caught engaging in fraud. And, and so there was a big scandal at that time, which, uh, to my knowledge, J.B. Ryan handled with uh, great dexterity and, and, and honesty and integrity by uh, admitting openly right off the bat that this had occurred and that none of Levy's uh, earlier research could be relied on at this point in time be because they found he was manipulating. He had set up such an elegant experiment. I remember taking photographs of all of his experimental equipment. He had rats running in mazes and and uh, devices that would give them electric shocks and uh, associated with a random event generator. And he was going to show experimentally that the rats somehow knew in advance when they were going to be shocked and they were uh, moving around their cages to avoid the electrical shocks. And it looked very promising, like this would be a repeatable experiment using animals. So you didn't even have to deal with human subjects who might cheat, but the animals, one would not expect a rat to cheat. <laughs> but, uh, and, and it was a huge disappointment for the whole field. But Ryan, I think, uh, managed to guide parapsychology through that crisis and, and did so in a very admirable way. But I myself was on the West Coast, and in those days there was a real difference, especially because I didn't have a lot of money to fly back and forth while I was a college student. There, there was a group of parapsychologists on the West Coast, Charlie Tart, who was on my doctoral committee and put off in target SRI. And we had our own regular meetings on, on the West Coast of a group called the Parapsychology Research Group that met er, every month in San Francisco. And, and so there was a, a, a sense of a different outlook between the West Coast and the East Coast of, of the United States. It's a big country. Were you aware of the Southern Californian Society for Psychical Research that had figures such as Raymond Bayliss and Elizabeth McAdams involved in that? I, I don't know how many branches really came up, 
besides we have obviously the Society for Psychical Research, 1882, between 1884, 85, we had the American Society for Psychical Research. There was the Toronto Society for Psychical Research, the Texas Society. Um, and so the, the Southern California one, I suppose, would that have been the closest one to you? You know, this, this was all in the days before the internet. <laughs> Post all the way. There, there was no internet back when I was a college student, and um, fortunately, as as you know, uh, I was associated with Scott Rogo, and I know you're working on a biography of Scott Rogo, who we considered each other distant cousins. My mother's maiden name was Rogo, spelled slightly differently, and and we thought that we probably had common ancestors uh, in Poland. But so I was aware of Scott and I was aware of his work with the Southern California Society for uh, Psychical Research. There was also in Berkeley the California Society for Psychical Study. I became president of it at one time and Lloyd Auerbach, who you I'm sure know, uh, also uh, followed me as president of the California Society for Psychical Study. The parapsychology research group that met in San Francisco. I don't think it's active any longer, but it was very active back in the 1970s. There was a very close-knit community in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Russell Targ over the years became one of my very closest friends. I, I think even though we had, I mean, it seems there were so many, you could call them subgroups of the SPR, interest groups everywhere, Times change and we don't get so many students now signing up to, to groups and memberships for this and that. What is the case now is YouTube and other formats like that. These are the, the new groups where we get people gathering to find out information about things and attending online lectures and indeed still places that also host the the face to face lectures. We're, we're just coming through the whole COVID crisis and learning a new way of things. Um, but where do you see things going forward with with education in, in parapsychology? I mean, what are your 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 I don't you're not stepping away from new thinking aloud, but you're saying that you want to get involved in other projects. So uh, is it more education based? Is it research based? What do you actually see the future for parapsychology moving forward? And where's your place in that? Well, of course, it will all work out in time, whatever plans that I may have, <laughs> you know, the universe may laugh at, but I am hoping to take my book, The PK Man, and, and turn it into a documentary while people who are, are still alive who remember those events that, that I documented. Uh, I'm hoping to take the Bigelow essay and turn it into another documentary. At the moment, we have companies in Hollywood that seem very interested, but we'll have to see because I've I've had lots of experience with people in Hollywood who can get very excited one day and barely know your name the next. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, well, I actually didn't say, but one of the qualities of parapsychology in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, where I came of age, was that there was also a big movement in, in what is known as transpersonal psychology, the psychology of spiritual experience, the study of the psychological principles underlying yoga and Buddhism and ancient forms of mysticism and, and shamanism. And so, many of the people in the parapsychology community were also in the transpersonal community, uh, particularly my own mentor, Charlie Tart. And I think I really have fallen into that pattern where I see parapsychology and transpersonal psychology is largely the same discipline. And so, uh, I think that that's the future, that, uh, that combination. You know, when I attended my first parapsychological conference, and now that I think about it, it wasn't in Durham, it was in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Rex Stanford was the president, and he gave his presidential address at that conference, and his topic was, are we scientists or shamans? And his 
attitude was, we, we can't be shamans, we must be scientists. And in retrospect, I, I understand Rex's position, I have great respect for him, but I think uh, ideally we have to be both. That side of things has been argued more recently with people like David Luke with the first person approach to parapsychology, get yourself in there, embrace the experience, and also um, Jack Hunter's work in, in the wider perspective of paraanthropology, looking at all these kinds of worldly experiences and yet again, embrace that kind of experience. Some of the early writings that Jack was doing was sitting in on, on various seances with uh, with mediums and embracing that experience and then stepping back afterwards. Whereas I've always had that approach as more of an objective parapsychologist of when I have been to seances that are still going on, standing on the outside and wandering around or sitting quietly, taking note and, and watching people have the experience. But I think both are important um, for a number of reasons. And I get many dissertation students doing qualitative research, wanting to interview people. And I always ask them, well, whatever this topic is, what's your experience of it? If it's bereavement, what loss have you suffered? Uh, one student right now looking at positive psychology within the birthing process. OK, well, have you had a child yourself or that, is there anyone close to you in the family? That, is, that had children and what do you remember of that process as well? How can you reflect on that to relate to the people that you're working with? So I absolutely agree that I think the more perspectives that we bring to the table on any given subject, the more that we're going to understand about it because we're, we're gathering so much about it from these different angles, we're mapping the territory. Well, one of the most important functions that you and I are engaged in at this very moment, creating a new thinking aloud video, is to provide a intellectual framework for people in the public at large who are having these experiences. And, and because there's still a taboo associated with this area, we hear, and I know you hear from people all the time who have uh, a wide range of uh, extraordinary experiences and they're afraid to talk about them because they're afraid people will think you're crazy if you start talking about it. But when they can tune in every week and practically every day to a very serious conversation such as we're having now about these topics, people begin to feel like it's okay. I can be myself. I can talk about it. There's a community of people who will support me. And I think ultimately what's going to turn the corner for parapsychology is not the practical applications as some think and not better experiments or more reliable psi as some think or practical applications as some people think or new theoretical models as some people think. I think the corner will be turned when more people in the public at large the 70 or 80 or 90 percent who are already privately admitting they experience telepathy, for example, will be comfortable being public about their own experiences. And uh, the conversation that you and I are having right now, Cal, is a, a step in that direction. It's like it, you make me think of uh, Rupert, <laughs> Rupert Sheldrake's talks on telepathy. I think it was when he was talking to Google. Um, that one was filmed in he, he'd reminisced about um, going to other departments and in the breaks, people coming up and saying, that's very interesting research. You know, don't tell anyone. But I actually had one of those experiences. Let me tell you. And more and more people over time, one by one. And so we'd go back to the podium and say, you all need a coming out party. You'd have a lot more fun if you realized that most of you in this room have had an experience. But you're absolutely right, Jeff. I mean, not only is this new new thinking allowed platform providing that forum for people to realize how common these experiences are what research has been done reduce any fears or anxieties that people have about those day-to-day -day experiences that they may have had that we term parapsychological or transpersonal um but i think it's also doing another thing um as i said we're in a new generation now and i hope that books don't ever go away we really need them but a lot of people source their information from the internet and i know our students listen to this channel i know many other universities throughout the uk especially dealing with parapsychology turn to new thinking aloud because of so many resources not only your original interviews with thinking aloud but through to now and how many um noted figures you know um you mentioned sally um, that one, wow, when I got my students to watch that and we'd just spoken about Ryan 
and um, Louisa and JB and saying this is their daughter who was also involved not only from a young age but later on. Listen to what she's got to say. They don't get that opportunity in person. That's a big ask to get someone to travel from one country to the other to go and give a lecture. And they probably have never really done that. But to to sit like this and have a good conversation, talk about the past and where you think things are going next. They really appreciate that. And I'm sure many people beyond academia as well really appreciate it as well. So thank you for what you've done so far. And I look forward to where things are going next. Thank you for having this chat, Jeff. Well, thank you, Cal. I want to welcome you as a, a new guest host on New Thinking Aloud. I think you've done a very credible job. I believe our viewers are getting a real sense of you as a uh, as a person, and I'm sure they're looking forward to learning more about you and your adventures. Uh, before we close, I want to say this, that uh, regarding your doctoral research, one of the reasons that I felt a kind of resonance with you, to be frank, is is you. If if I understand it correctly, part of your one of your two doctoral degrees involves uh, led to your book about telephone calls from the dead. It was the other way round, actually. So um, I did the first one by research, and that was on the after death communications, looking at positive psychology. And then as soon as I'd done that, I was doing a lot of work with Manchester Metropolitan University, guest lecturing on parapsychology. And I was looking at other options for students I had approaching me wanting to be supervised. And that was partly down the route of PhD by published works. And I'd done so much regarding telephone anomalies, published peer reviewed papers, chapters and the book, Telephone Calls from the Dead, that I thought, well, why not while I'm here working with these colleagues? put it together as a portfolio, write a critical commentary and go through the whole examination again, but with a PhD that is more or less strictly parapsychology, talking about methods and theories for survival. Now, to what extent within these experiences, is there any evidence to suggest people are talking to the dead? And, and let's actually hammer out this debate. So I started talking about ruling out how we go about separating all these conventional explanations through to ESP and PK possibilities, and then spirit hypothesis beyond that. Um, so I, I thought it a good opportunity to, to really kind of do a structured piece on all the things I'd done to date to see how it could help me with the next step. So it's got a lot of uses and applications personally for where the writing on that goes next. Well, what I admired about your willingness to take on that particular topic is that it's an example of what I would call high strangeness. Most people <laughs> consider the very notion of receiving a telephone call from a deceased individual to be too bizarre to even consider. But you were willing to consider it very seriously and apply all of your skills as a psychologist to evaluating it. Uh, I had a similar experience while I was in graduate school working with the, the claims of Ted Owens, the PK man, who was so controversial that uh, my good friends Hal Putoff and Russell Targ at SRI uh, were eager to get the files out of their hands, out of their office completely, and, and they just turned the whole thing over to me. And even the Rhines. Uh, knew Ted Owens. Sally Ryan, who we've just been talking about, was a teenager herself uh, when Ted Owens uh, worked as an assistant to J.B. Ryan, Ted Owens being the subject of my book, The PK Man. Uh, and the Rhines were very embarrassed by Ted Owens and his abilities. Louisa Ryan once reached out to me and said, please don't mention our name in conjunction with, with Ted Owens. But I felt it was important to, in spite of the fact that it's so bizarre and his personality was so over the top that uh, people didn't want to be associated with him. It was, uh, he was, you know, an outrageous character, sort of like, I think of him as the Paul Bunyan uh, of parapsychology, if you're familiar with American folklore. And uh, the, the willingness to push and take a serious look at the kinds of phenomenon that most people think are too ridiculous to even consider, I think is a very important characteristic that you and I share in common. 
Well, I, I was at least in the fortunate circumstance that publishers wanted the book. You had the unfortunate one that when it was Earth's Ambassador and you were doing it with Scott Rogo, your initial attempt was the publishers thought it was too strange. Yeah, that's partially true. We had a publishing contract and uh, and then the publishing uh, company, it was Dutton, as I recall, at the time got bought out by another company. A new editor came in and dropped the project. Uh, and then when we resubmitted it to other publishers, we heard, I heard from an editor, as I think I probably told you, that uh, this is not a good uh, piece of fiction. They couldn't even digest the idea that it was nonfiction. So, yeah, that manuscript uh, that Scott Rogo and I wrote, as I remember, in 1979, sat in my basement for 20 years bef before I felt comfortable publishing it. Well, I'm happy to be sat with you in the company of high strangeness. So we'll keep pressing on with that and be fearless in our pursuits. Thank you so much, Cal. It's been a real pleasure to have this time with you and uh, a delight to have this conversation. Yep, you too, Jeff. Thank you to all the listeners of New Thinking Aloud and thank you for having me here. It's been wonderful and we'll see you all again soon. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.